Hi everyone, I'm Hemant Kakar, Assistant Professor in the Management Department at the Fuqua School of Business. A lot of you former Fuqua students and associate might not have seen me before because I joined Fuqua a little less than a year ago. And well, it has been quite a year. Actually for all of us, it has been quite a year. So today's talk is part of a special series Fuqua has launched on LinkedIn to share business insights around issues of fairness, justice, and race. And in case if you have missed any session or yesterday's session by Ronnie Chatterjee, don't worry, you can find all the other videos right here on Fuqua's page. I also want to give you a heads up uh, about what's been going on in my building. So you might hear a fire alarm. Uh, my building supervisor informed me this morning that they are conducting a fire safety drill right now. It was buzzing in like two minutes ago. So apologies for that in advance if, they, if you hear the alarm sound again, but nothing to worry. So today I will focus more on the justice side uh, of the issue, specifically how can one maintain a sense of fairness and justice in workplace and beyond. Given the ongoing protests that have highlighted unfairness or lack of equality and systematic racism in the country, there has been a lot of discussion in the mainstream as well as in the social media about the importance of justice and fairness. Among many things, a paper published recently in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences about a month ago has been getting a lot of attention and rightly so because it is highly relevant of our times. And some of you might have come across this research. The study was conducted with the Chicago Police Department. The authors showed that extensive training on procedural justice among policemen reduces police use of force and complaints against the officers. So what is procedural justice? What is this training about? So procedural justice is the idea that when pursuing any action, any action X, everyone is bound by the same rules of procedures and those rules should be followed in order to achieve X. So the procedural justice training in this study was thus focused on increasing transparency in police actions, explaining to citizens why they are taking a certain action, etc. Overall, the authors found that this intervention, that is procedural justice training, reduced the use of force among the Chicago Police Department by about 6%. So the number 6% is by no means a high figure, but learning about appropriate procedures and fairness did mitigate police use of force. And that's the important finding. However, the problem with these interventions based on training is that most of the time, this is just a one-off training and we don't really know how the effect of these trainings will pan out in the long term. Secondly, a lot of organizations, not just the police department, conduct many such trainings and it becomes more like a check, check box that has to be ticked. Uh, training police officials on implicit bias, which Rick talked about on Monday, has also become one of these checkbox activity. And in fact, a lot of officials take it as a one-off session, but that does not cure the bias. And you may have heard that a number of police officials who have been accused of unjust practices have indeed taken this implicit bias training. So in short, one might see the positive effects of training in the beginning, but how can this be sustained in the long term is the question that uh, I'm asking. And today I want to make a case that encouraging employee expression of voice or speaking up can be one such practice that might help sustain the effect of such measures and training over the long term. A part of my research examines employees tendency to speak up in organization about new ideas that could bring about possible innovation or creativity at the workplace or talk about problems that lurk in the environment that people are not aware of which can become a significant issue for the organization and can hurt their productivity or efficiency. So such behaviors uh, are typically described as employee voice, basically employee giving these suggestions for change, uh, sometimes with new ideas or sometimes letting organizations know about a problem. However, as researchers, or when I'm talking about the importance of employee voice to students in class or with cons uh, organizational leaders when I'm doing a consultancy project, I and others who work on topics encourage who work on this topic encourage organizations and management to put in place practices that allows employees to speak up. The idea being that employees who work in trenches who are at the forefront are more aware of the issues at hand or of future opportunities that organization could benefit from and bringing those to the forefront can help organization perform better. In short, we discuss the importance of encouraging employees voice because of its potential to increase organizational revenue or profit. That is, 
we care for employer voice because it makes a good business sense and in a business school we should teach and talk about things that make a good business sense however i want to make the case today that organizations leaders and we as organizational researchers and instructors have to move beyond the business logic and make a social justice case for employee voice hearing what employees have to say for social causes can bring a sense of fairness and justice among employees and make an organization or management appear more geared towards their social environment this idea of speaking up is also in line with what ashley and ronnie discussed in this forum before specifically ashley talked about the importance of not staying silent and ronnie yesterday highlighted the importance of ceos taking a stand so the first question you can ask is why now should we be making a case for employee voice what has changed and to answer that why i'll prelude a little bit of what my colleague angelica might discuss in more detail tomorrow so in our daily life we are very good at compartmentalizing different versions of our social life for instance more often than not we leave our political opinions at home and do not discuss those at work places and definitely do not make business decisions based on that most of the time likewise we try to maintain a distance from issues at work creeping into our personal life will we live these different social identities in parallel and seldom let them and seldom let them cross that is we are basically good at compartmentalizing different aspects of ourselves however such identities cross whenever there is a great personal unrest in our lives or upheaval in society that's when we find it hard to compartmentalize different aspects of ourselves given these tumultuous past few months first the pandemic and then injustices on our street brought to light forces us to reevaluate our relationship with this entity that is the organization we are working for we start examining our relationship through a personal perspective and want them to hear us take a stand rather than just worry about their revenues and bottom line and it's probably fair to say that employees who see their organization take a stand and give them an opportunity to speak up will definitely feel a greater personal att attachment to the organization hence as an organization one cannot ignore the importance of providing employees with a forum to speak up and then eventually provide an opportunity to act on some of those suggestions so the first point i want to make is to treat employee voice not based just on the idea of business logic but one that is backed by the idea of social justice the question then becomes what can we as organizations leaders and employees do to encourage employee expression of voice as a means of social justice i will discuss implement three implementable strategies for all the three stakeholders that is organization leaders and employees who want to speak up so let's begin with organizations so from the organization point of view what can you do to encourage employee voice in these trying times first and foremost as i mentioned provide a safe forum for employees to express their anguish disillusionment over a sense of injustice the forum should be a safe haven where people could express ideas of for change and how one can bring about a more positive change in society the second point and perhaps more important than the first is for organizations to take a stand on the current issue it's not enough to make space for employees to express their opinion but also make explicit where does the organization stand on those issues being ambiguous in this situation does not help the organization or its employees basically failing to take a stand you're telling your workers that you don't care for them and more importantly you don't care for what's happening in our society by and large and there were reflections of it in a recent op-ed uh, that came out in new york times i think a couple of days ago where there were reports that journalists at bloomberg an organization which is wedded to a culture of absolute neutrality uh, it was found that these journalists were frustrated they asked their employer if they could at least tweet bloomberg's own editorials supporting the protesters supporting the protest now imagine the scenario you as a reporter publish stories about protests on bloomberg's website maxine etc but are not allowed to talk about it and therefore it's not a surprise that a lot of them are frustrated and peeved at bloomberg's behavior likewise you might have heard about internal protest in facebook 
when a number of Facebook employees staged a virtual walkout after Mark Zuckerberg decided not to add a fact checker indicator for misinformation on Facebook pages. Both of these instances highlight why it's important for organization to take a stand. In short, taking a stand and creating space for employees to voice can not only help employees to express their discontent, but also give them a sense of instrumentality. That is, they can do something about the current situation. So take for an instance, we as a group speaking to you in this special series on ethics, race and justice is a great example of what FUQA and Duke stand for and what it means for us as employees of this organization. By taking stand against racism and allowing several of us to speak on this important issue, it has given us a platform to express voice and hopefully bring about a change. Now to the second point, moving to the second stage of stakeholders, leaders. If you are someone who's managing a group of employees, what can you do to ensure that employees are not hesitant to speak up? How can you help the employees? Research shows that the most effective thing a leader can do is create a safe environment, give employees a sense of psychological safety. That is, when they speak up, it will not be held against them. They will not be judged harshly or given poor performance review just because maybe you as a leader don't agree with their opin opinion, team members do not agree with it, or because it's a lone dissenting voice. It is hard to inculcate a sense of psychological safety and environment of psychological safety. But if done right, it takes a lot of effort. But if done right, the research has shown that it can lead to better team performance, team morale, and individual satisfaction. Something as business leader, we all should look forward to. The second most important thing a leader can do is to know how to respond to employee voice, how to respond to their suggestion. If your response is most often that the suggestion is not good enough, it lacks quality, then as a leader, you are failing in your most critical aspect of the job, which is to give a positive and constructive feedback. By letting employees know that you're not good enough, you are es essentially curtailing their contribution for future suggestions, which could be critical, um, we never know. And frankly, irrespective of whether the idea can be really critical, could be really important, as a leader, one should be aware of giving a more constructive response to employee suggestion. In light of this, a systematic review of research on employee speaking behavior finds that one of the essential ingredients of speaking up is the confidence that an employee has in his or her ability. Hence, as a leader, be mindful not to hurt the confidence of those who you supervise. Now, finally, my last recommendations are reserved for employees, leaders, and anybody who wants to speak up. Uh, there are certain facts and myths that despite all our favorable, that despite all favorable conditions in place, that is, we have a forum to speak up, we have a sense of psychological safety, or we even get constructive feedback from the leader, we might still not end up speaking up despite having something to say, despite wanting to speak up. So what are some of those fallacies? What are some of those myths? And first myth is that, is that this idea of psychological standing. Basically what this means is, is saying, I don't belong here. So should I be speaking up? Let me explain this a bit. For instance, I'm not a woman. So maybe it's not my place to talk about those issues. Similarly, I'm not African-American. So should I be talking about racism? In short, this psychological barrier that I'm speaking about is one of legitimacy, where we ask ourselves this question, is it right for me to talk about racism? Do I have a license to speak about it? Because I don't look like the aggrieved community and my voice might not be perceived as genuine. So this, this idea of legitimacy, genuineness drives this kind of psychological barrier of standing. Do I, am I in the right place? Do I to speak about these certain things? And the short answer is, it is absolutely right and important for you to speak up. Do not worry about this legitimacy license because if we have something to say, we are coming from a position of privilege. And as any privileged person, it is our obligation, our duty to talk about those issues, even if I may not be a woman, African-American, Hispanic, or any other minority that is being harmed. It does not matter. 
being an immigrant and having spent less than a year in the U US, I could have easily succumbed to this myth and decided not to do this session, not to speak about what I want to say. No one would have held it against me, trust me. But we can't afford to, that's the reality, especially when we want to have a positive change in society, especially when we want to help several others. And in fact, talking about this reminds me of an influential work by a political scientist, Elizabeth Noel Newman, about informational cascades that are set in motion when one person decides not to speak up, despite having something to say. So what happens in that situation? Well, others take a cue from you and they also decide not to speak up. And this sets up this domino effect of lack of information flow within the groups, teams, and organizations where no one is speaking about the issues at hand. She describes this phenomena very tellingly, tellingly as spirals of silence. And once they are set in motion, it ensures to propagate the status quo. So if we are silent, despite having an opinion, we are complicit in preserving the status quo. So please don't let this idea of psychological standing or license deter you from speaking up. The second myth is, I don't have a personality of someone who speaks up, you know. I have a friend who I know is very extroverted. He or she speaks up a lot. They have that kind of a personality. It's not in my personality to speak up. And this again is a myth, it's not right. Uh, in one of my research, I actually set up a horse race between personality factors that allows one to speak up or do not allow one to speak up and how much importance they give to voice or to speaking up in their job. And what I found was it's basically if individuals are giving more importance to speaking up, their personality does not matter. Even those who were indisposed to speaking up because of their personality, they engaged in more voice, they express their opinion more, as long as they construed it as part of their job, as long as they construed voice as important. So if you're making an argument that it's not my personality, probably you need to look at, have you really construed voice as something important as part of your job? Because that is what drives the effect rather than personality. The third myth, when I give an idea, to my boss or to someone, actually I need to provide a lot of justification or evidence in support of my opinion. So this is partly true uh, that you do need to give some justification, but where it's not true is that you need to give a lot of justification. Why? Because when you go looking for a lot of justification, you end up providing a lot of weak arguments with the strong ones. And when you combine weak arguments with the strong ones, the effect it has on the listener or the person you are pitching your idea to, they tend to average out your overall argument and the quality of your overall argument comes down. So essentially, if you have a choice between providing two strong reasons to justify your argument versus six reasons where four are pretty weak arguments, then go with the strong ones. So you don't need a lot of justification, you just need very few but good ones, don't go for the numbers. The fourth myth, and this is kind of counterintuitive, you know, the fourth myth comes from this idea, when you think a lot of people are aware of the issue, you think someone will talk about it. Let me explain this with, with a popular story, which has been there quite a lot in psychology literature. So in 1964, a 28-year-old woman named Kitty Genovese was, was stabbed outside her apartment building in the New York City. The New York Times later published an article claiming that 38 witnesses saw or heard the attack, but none of them called the police or came to her aid. And this is basically called the bystander effect, where a lot of people are watching, a lot of people are aware of this incident, but they are not talking about it because they think someone else will do it. And this diffusion of responsibility, basically someone else will do it, can really hamper uh, your expression of voice. So you don't have to really assume that someone else will do the job for you. Uh, if a lot of them know it, you need to speak up. And that's a very popular myth, which a lot of people uh, end up uh, end up into and not speaking about it. So to wrap up, uh, I want to underscore that it is really up to us to make sure we as employees, leaders speak up about social issues and organizations offer a forum to ensure employee voices are heard and also take a stand. Otherwise, it can lead to a spiral of silence and staying silent propagates the status quo. 
So my message is very simple today that speaking up should be encouraged not because it makes a good business sense, but because it's a means to create a just system and preserve a sense of equality and fairness in organizations and society. As business leaders, professors, instructors, and scholars, we should start making a social justice case for employee voice. I'll stop here and answer any of the questions that you might have for me. Thanks. So one question is, what happens if my opinion or suggestion is not supported by the majority? So what happens when you're kind of a dissenting voice, you are a minority voice? Actually, this, this reminds me of, a, a, of an important research on minority influence. And if you are interested, you should look up, uh, you should look up a psychologist, Charlotte Nemeth. She has a, actually a book on it. And the way they talk about minority influence is, is slightly different than if majority is of the opinion, uh, if majority is of a certain opinion. So when majority agrees that we want to pursue X, everyone conforms to it. There's this idea of conformity. But if you are in a minority, this takes place slightly differently. Uh, if you're a minority, you talk about the idea you want to talk about, and it takes a time for the idea to develop and fester. Uh, it, it goes through a process of conversion. So first it changes people's private opinion. And only then after you have been consistent about it, once their private opinion has changed, it kind of blooms and uh, change and and then changes and becomes more of a majority opinion. So I've simplified that uh, text, that research a little bit, uh, but this is, uh, this is the idea of minority influence. And if you're interested in reading more about it, uh, do take a look at the book by Charlene Nemeth uh, on this topic. Okay, let's look at the next question. So the next question is, and it's quite an interesting one, which is how can we make sure our ideas are actually acted upon? I think this is the right question. Until now, I have talked about we should speak up, uh, but how, how can we make sure our ideas are executed, are implemented? Uh, and there has been some work from communications literature, some work from the influence literature, which can actually speak about it. So. Uh, if you look at Bob Cialini's work, uh, he, he talks about various ways in which you can influence others and make them act on your ideas, uh, or the ideas of reciprocity, the ideas of using expert opinion uh, and things like that. But mostly in the voice literature, people have looked at if, your, if it is come from, if the idea is coming from someone who has had success in the past, so someone who's credible, uh, their ideas gets implemented. So this is kind of very person specific. But if you're not that kind of a person who have not had success, what can you do? Uh, and the research says, the first thing you can do, do not convey your idea or your opinion such that it threatens the other person. So if you're making an opinion to your supervisor, to your boss, do not say the idea or challenge them in such a way that it is an affront on their competence. It may make them think that uh, they are not competent enough and you, so the idea should be said with a sense of empathy and perspectives taking. As long as you're wedded to getting the idea across, that's all that matters. And you don't have to challenge someone's competence. So, so if you want to pitch an idea and make sure it gets executed, say it in a way that, so that it's appealing to the other person. That's the most important thing uh, I can say about ideas being getting executed. The next question is, can the employee voice affect the employee's employment? Uh, I'm assuming this, this question is more about uh, in terms of long terms, will, will the employees, uh, will employees chances of, you know, will they, there'll be a greater turnover and things like that. And I think the answer, and I think it's to a certain extent, it's right. There has been research which shows that if employees are not given a chance to voice, they do exit the organization. So it's important. Uh, you give employees a platform to speak, 
Otherwise, you might see a turnover in the long term. There's also chances of turnover if employees are voicing, but you are not as a leader, as a boss, you're not hearing them. So that also leads to turnover. There is some work by Ethan Buris uh, showing that. So yes, in the short answer is employee voice, not hearing employee voice or not providing a forum for employee voice can lead to employees uh, turnover. Okay, the next question. The next question is, do you think comp companies should take days off to reflect and consider this right now? I'm not sure if, you, if companies need to take days off, but I do agree that we need to reflect on this and consider this uh, as an important element of our business practices. Uh, it is very important for us to talk about employee voice. It is very important for us to talk about issues of fairness and justice. And it is very important to, for us right now, given the environment, to talk about social issues that are affecting employees in their personal life and whatever said and done, they can't leave it behind when they come to work. So it is very important. So thanks, uh, Tom, uh, Wilson and Alam of the school uh, for asking that question. I think we are almost uh, towards the end of the session. So before I leave, let me just uh, tell you about tomorrow's session. So tomorrow's session uh, is by Angelica Lee. She's a new addition to our faculty and she will talk about how pivotal events like the death of George Floyd and national protests can spark real and lasting change. Uh, she's an amazing and wonderful scholar. Her dissertation is right on this topic and I can't think of a better person to talk about these kind of things. So I'm really looking forward to her talk tomorrow and I hope uh, you can join as well. So thank you again for your questions and participations and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.